The Amen. Amen. What does Amen mean? If I was to ask, who said that? So be it. So that's the, the traditional answer to that question. So be it. It's a word lifted, isn't it? Straight out of the Hebrew. Anna tells me it's pronounced Amen. Um, and in fact, it's lifted straight out. And the interpreters, they didn't choose to, in, uh, the translators didn't choose to interpret this word as so be it. They chose to leave in the original meaning, which of course, you know, was in the Greek, which came from the Hebrew. The word actually carries two ideas. It conveys two ideas. In fact, those two ideas were here in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. It has these two kind of sides to it, that yes, I agree with what has been said, like, like I am faithful to it. And also, I believe that what has been said is true, faithful and true. I agree with it and I believe it. There's two things there. And that's what this word really means, this lovely little word. And what we want to do this evening, God willing, is, is to try and unlock it, to look at how the word of God uses this word and, and how perhaps we can use it. So there's a practical side but also to look at how and why the Lord Jesus Christ is termed the Amen here in this passage in Revelation chapter 3. Now, we've, we've mentioned here, here, here it comes up, it is used as a title by the spokesman of Revelation, the one who is writing to the Ecclesia of Laodicea here in Revelation chapter 3. So let's just remind ourselves of who this one who is speaking is. So if we flick over to Revelation chapter 1, you'll remember in Revelation chapter 1 how we read that it is Jesus who is speaking because we read there in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, I don't know if you've ever actually considered um, that in that little passage of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, we have what I like to call the revelation rules, right? The three rules that if you don't move away from, you will actually be able to interpret revelation effectively as as we do as, as we do as Christadelphians. So the first rule is that this book of Revelation, okay, it's for the servants of Christ. That's the first thing. So it's not here to persuade you to become a servant. This book has been revealed only to servants, people who already understand the gospel, who have already been baptized into the first principles of the faith, who already have accepted and put on Christ. These, this message is for those servants. And so when we speak to churches outside and they try and tell us, for example, in Revelation chapter 12, that there's some fundamental first principle um, doctrines revealed about Satan, for example, suddenly we realize, well, hold on, this cannot be the case, you know, because this is already written for servants, people who have already taken on the saving name of Christ people who have already believed the gospel. So that's rule number one. It's for the servants of Christ. Rule number two, we read that it is to show unto these servants things which must shortly come to pass. And so this is an explanation that this, is, this revelation is going to unfold things that is going to come to pass from the Apostle John's day and forward. Okay, so this is not going to go back in time. Looking at that, you know, the, the churches, they tell us that Revelation 12 takes us to the time when Satan fell from heaven right before, right back before the Garden of Eden. Well, that cannot be the case because in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 here, we're told it's going to reveal things which are about to come to pass, not stuff that's already happened. This is the continual historic um, manifestation of God's purpose down through time. It's not going to reveal things prior to John's time. And the final thing in verse, uh, in verse one is that it says that it was sent and signified by the angel unto his servant John. And of course, we understand that to mean that this book was encoded. It's a book of symbol. It was signified, a book of sign. And so what we have to do when we open the book of Revelation is we're going to come across very strange, very odd things if we look at them literally. 
But as we know, what we have to do is we have to unlock the code. We have to unlock the symbols. And so we have to go back through the scriptures of truth to find what God meant when he revealed certain things to us. Um, and it's the same here. We're talking about the Amen, because the Amen is nothing uh, short of, again, a symbol that we need to unlock, to gain meaning from, to understand. And when we do so, we gain amazing strength and, uh, and wonder at the truth of God's word. Just a couple of quick things. If you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, this person who is speaking, the Lord Jesus Christ, says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And he tells John in verse 19 to write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And so we know that the things which he had seen up to that point is recorded there in chapter one. And so we have to ask the question, well, what are the things that are? Well, if you just flick over to Revelation chapter four, you read in verse one at the end of that, that this, this, um, this trumpet talks with John, symbols, and says to him, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so chapters two and three must be the, um, the, the things which, um, let me just get this right, which are the things that he'd already seen recorded in chapter one, the things which are chapters two and three, and then the things which will be hereafter are recorded from chapter four onwards. And of course, the things that are were the letters, the epistles that the Lord Jesus Christ wrote to those seven ecclesias. Um, and he reveals himself in the, as the Amen in the last of those seven to the letter of Laodicea, which uh, David re read for us earlier on. And we're told, aren't we, right at the end, in verse 22 of chapter 3, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the ecclesias. Evidently, brothers and sisters, evidently, you can have ears and still not hear. So how are we, how are we doing with our listening? How are we doing with our hearing? as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure you are the same as me, that although we might struggle with parts of Revelation, with, with some of the symbols, with some of the meaning, surely, brothers and sisters, it is essential that we should be trying to listen, to hear, to what the Spirit has to say. It's crucial, isn't it, brothers and sisters, if we've got ears and we want to follow and be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we, that we try, that we unroll up our sleeves and that we... We try and dig into the word to understand the meaning of this final message that the Lord Jesus Christ has written to us. And hopefully we'll do some of that this evening in this little phrase, the Amen. Here are the, the seven um, ecclesias. And this city of Laodicea, um, just here in, on the right hand side, is in modern day Turkey. Apparently when, they, when they've excavated it, they found that, the, that there, were, there were three circuses at that city. It was medically advanced. There was this large medical school. And interestingly, um, it supposedly was um, kind of specialised in nose and eye ointments. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because in verse 18, Jesus counsels these Laodiceans to, uh, to buy of him uh, and anoint their, their eyes with eye salve that they may as see. Now, what's tragic about this epistle that Christ writes to this ecclesia in Laodicea is that there is not one positive thing said about this ecclesia. Not one positive thing. So in all the other epistles, you'll find some, some positive things, some commendation by the Lord. Philadelphia, there's nothing bad said about them, the love of the brethren. But this ecclesia here in Laodicea, there is not one good thing said about what they were doing and in fact they thought that they were doing just fine they were they thought they were rich they were increased with goods in verse 17 they thought they had need of nothing but the lord says to them don't you know you are wretched you are miserable you are poor you're in fact you're blind and you're actually naked spiritually speaking you need to sort yourselves out you need to, to change. You need to repent. This is what the 
the city, these are the ruins of the city. You can see it was a place of great wealth located in the Lycus River uh, Valley of Western Asia Minor in Turkey. There was this stadium, there were some baths, there were temples, there was a gym, Chafin. Um, there was all sorts of things there. It was a, it was a, a, a you know, a, a big city. This is one of the, um, the, the kind of amphitheaters, a place of entertainment. The people there had time, they had money, they had cash to spend in the uh, satisfaction of the flesh. And of course, there was paganism around all uh, and uh, in the very, all the, the, t the gods and the temples that were worshipped there. Not one good thing. They were not hot or cold. They were not zealous for the truth and they were not calm and refreshing. To the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, you're just, I just want to spew you out of my mouth. You need to sort yourselves out. And what really seemed to be obnoxious to the Lord was the fact that they thought they were totally fine. They were really blind. They were really naked. They had confidence in the wealth that surrounded them like cotton wool. They had become spiritually desolate. Now, why is this important to us, brothers and sisters, today? Why is it important to you and why is it important to me? Well, I suggest to you that we live in a society which is given over to entertainment, which is given over to thinking that it needs absolutely nothing from God. We are living in the same circumstances, in the Laodicean state, brothers and sisters, and is it therefore not fitting that we take the warning to ourselves to consider that if we have confidence in the things around us, that we may become wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked ourselves. That we might be being exhorted to buy Isau from the Lord to anoint our lives, eyes that we might see. That we, in verse 18, um, it says, count, he, he gives them counsel to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. That's the kind of gold the Lord wants, tried faith, and white raiment, the righteousness of the saints, <clears throat> that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and that we need to anoint our eyes with eye salve, that we may see. We have to live these things ourselves, don't we, and take the warnings to ourselves, because we are living in the Laodicean state. This is what the historians say. I was hoping to read that, but I don't know if I can crane my neck, but I'll try my best. Laodicea, though formerly small, grew large in our time and in that of our fathers, even though it had been damaged by siege in the time of, I can't read that, Mithaedus Eurepata. Forgive me. However, it was the fertility of its territory and the prosperity of certain of its citizens that made it great. The country round Laodicea produces sheep that are excellent, not only for the softness of their wool, in which they surpass even the Malaysian wool, but also for its raven black colour, so that the Laodiceans derive splendid revenue from it. Strabo, great Greek um, historian. Isn't that interesting? Jesus, they're famous for their, for their wool, and uh, it was a lovely black colour. Jesus says, you're naked, you need to buy of me white garments. Strabo goes on to say, in my own time, a great, um, and again, I'm going to struggle with this word, hero Philetian school of medicine has been established by Xerxes, and afterwards carried on by Alexander Philates. I'm not good at Greek, so I don't claim to be good at Greek. But the point here is, look, there was this great school of medicine there. Isn't it interesting that, that, that history backs up what the word of God reveals to us here? We have great medical advancements in our time, don't we, brothers and sisters? And it is lovely to benefit from these things, but do we trust in them is the question that we are being asked here. And Christ decides through the internal spirit, through God's inspiration, to reveal himself here to these people, to this ecclesia who thought it had everything, as the Amen, the faithful, and the true witness in verse 14. The main message 
to this ecclesia was in verse, 13, uh, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You know, sometimes we can, we can think, ah, oh, that brother who's trying to tell me to, to pull my socks up, you know, who does he think he is? But that brother might be telling us these things because of his great love for us. And that's what's happening here with the Lord Jesus Christ. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And so he says, because I love you, because I care about you as a ecclesia in this difficult city of Laodicea, I'm going to chasten you. I'm not going to let you carry on uh, as you are without, without challenging your behavior. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Turn yourselves around from this way of life, from this culture that you find yourselves in. Christ reveals himself as the Amen to them, as this title. Now, why does he do this? Let's go to, uh, to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. As we say, to unlock the symbols in the book of Revelation, we have to, don't we, go to the other parts of God's word and be led by the Spirit in that sense, the Spirit word, to compare spiritual things with spiritual so let's see what we can glean from other parts of Scripture that might be have a bearing upon this title of the Amen. And we, we have such a, a bearing, I would suggest, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and, uh, and verse 19, which says, well, actually, if we, if we start actually at verse, um, verse, eight, uh, verse 17, when I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness or the things that I purpose? Do I purpose according to the flesh that with me there should be yea, yea and nay, nay? But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the, Lord, for, the, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth us with you is in Christ, and hath anointed us is God, and so it goes on. So what's this saying? Well, it's saying, that when the Lord Jesus Christ, when the gospel message was preached to the Corinthians, was it kind of like, yay and nay, yay, maybe, nay, maybe? Was it, was it dithering? Was it, was it unsound? Was it unsure? No, it was not. It was yay and nay. It was clear what was right. It was clear what was wrong. It was true, verse 18. As God is true, our word toward you was not yay and nay. It wasn't dithering. It wasn't man's opinion. This is the truth of God. And then it says, For all the promises of God in him, Christ, are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. So this word, amen, it, it connects to the promises that are fulfilled in Christ. It's saying to us that not... That, not, that, that Christ will fulfill all the promises of God, not just bits of them, not just parts of them. He's going to fulfill all of them. It says in Romans 15 verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And these promises weren't yea and nay in him. They're all going to be fulfilled in him unto the glory of God. It says in verse 20, the Amen is going, to, um, is going to do this. And you know, it says that in him, Amen. Some translations, Young's Literal, for example, records that that should be translated the Amen, in the Amen. And suddenly we realize it's connecting us back to Revelation chapter 3. The Amen, the one who is the faithful and true witness, the one who would fulfill the promises of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is possible because of him. In him, there is, there is this complete fulfillment of God's ways. 
Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 5. It was funny because, um, it's funny how many things fit together because I understand this morning when we, um, when we had our commandments read to us, it's a lovely tradition that you have here in Brantford. We don't have that in Nottingham. I'd love to, uh, to see if we could influence that and bring that in. But you had, um, you had this actually in, uh, in your commandment for today. I don't know if you remember. In Matthew chapter to 5, read this um, for context. If we read uh, verse 33, the master exhorts us. He says, again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than, this, than these cometh of evil. And so, just as Christ was yea or nay, he was certain. And just as Christ will certainly fulfill the promises of God, and just as God is true, and that the things of Christ don't wane and wax and, and, and flop around, doesn't dither, so we should be like that in our lives. That's what it's saying to us, isn't it? Men and women of our word, it should be good enough that we say yes. It should be good enough that we say no, we don't need to start swearing oaths, we don't start need to, to, to kind of um, layering on top of that. Our word should be enough. Now that might be why, brothers and sisters, it's a suggestion, suddenly when we, when we weave these passages together, suddenly we, we think, well, maybe that's why Christ chose to reveal himself to that ecclesia in Laodicea, that wealthy, luxurious ecclesia, because perhaps, just perhaps, they were a bit yay and nay. Perhaps they had one foot in the world and one foot in the truth. And they were trying to straddle both. And Jesus says, you can't do both. I'm the amen, the faithful, the true witness. Be faithful and true. Repent. Come out. Stop this apathy. Be true to the calling of the, the, the gospel. The antidote, brothers and sisters, to apathy is certainty, isn't it? To be sure, to commit ourselves, to identify ourselves with the Lord. It's tough, isn't it? It's really tough. Because this world is trying to pull us down, pull us down, soften up, soften up. You can't be sure of anything. There is no truth. It's not God's way, is it, brothers and sisters? This is a reminder of God's truth. These promises will be fulfilled in Christ. We are certain of this. This is not the time to dither on the first principles. This is a time to stand up for them, brothers and sisters. This is not a time to take a step back from them. It's not just a New Testament idea, this idea of the Amen. Let's go flip back to Isaiah chapter 65. Now the context of Isaiah 65 is quite interesting because the context is that there were those who chose to do that which God delighted not in. You can see that, for example, in verse 12. It says there, therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. And so what we find is that Isaiah prophesies, and he talks to those who were not like that. Look at what says in verse, look at what it says in verse 15. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord Yahweh shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. So there was there was going to be these those in the in, in the nation, in the enlightened community, who had not chosen to do God's ways, who had chosen to do those things which God did not delight in. And so he was going to remove their name, they would become a curse. But he was going to take these servants and he was going to call those, these, these faithful servants by another name. Look what it says here. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth 
And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. So at some point in the future, right, there's going to be this faithful group of people who are going to be called by another name, and they're going to bless themselves in the earth. And what is the name through which they're going to bless themselves or, or, or perceive themselves as being blessed? Through the God of truth, the mighty ones of the Amen, the Elohim of Amen, as it means, the mighty ones of faithfulness. And here it's in the plural, I understand in Hebrew, the mighty ones, the Elohim. And so in Revelation, we have the singular Amen, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have a group of mighty ones who are called the Amen, the mighty ones of faithfulness. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that this is talking about the saints in the kingdom age. They are the ones upon which those in the nation eventually will look to and consider themselves blessed because they have a part of, in the mighty ones of the Amen. Jesus is going to come back as king, isn't he, brothers and sisters? And the saints are going to live and reign with him. They're going to take on that kingship element of the Lord in a lesser degree than the Lord. They are going to also be priests like Christ is the high priest. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. And so the blessings and the titles and the role of the Lord will also be given to his servants, God willing to you and I in that kingdom age. We will share in those blessings. And so it just seems quite logical that, that we also will obtain this title, the Elohim of the Amen, the, uh, the mighty ones of faithfulness in that day that the faithful will feel blessed to be in, to be connected with. Amazing. Now, I want to show you a couple of, we're going to flip to a few passages now, because, and I want to show you that all of this has to do with the promises of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These words that keep coming up, blesseth, sweareth, the God of truth. This is all covenant language. And once you see it, you see it, when you do your readings, you'll, you'll notice this language. It's, it's all about confirmation. It's all about trust. It's all about confidence in God's ways. Just, um, just turn to Genesis chapter 22, just for a, for a moment. We're going to look at verses uh, 17 to 18. We're, we're back with Abraham, the father of the faithful, the friend of God. And, um, and we'll just pick up on a couple of things. We're in one of the promises. Revelate, uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. That in blessing... There's our word, they will feel that they were blessed. Blessing, I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And so in this covenant to, to Abraham, this idea of the blessed, and who will be blessed, and who they will be blessed in, is revealed to us in, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now flick over to Psalm 72, that famous psalm, that prophecy of the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will be in the earth and God will give him the role of being that king, that judgment king, as we read of in verse 1. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. A prophecy of the kingdom. What does it say in verse 17? His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be Yahweh God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And so we have this certain fulfillment of these things as the psalmist is inspired to double up on the Amen at the end there, and we have the connection with the blessed, and we have the connection then back to Abraham and the covenants of old, that the earth will be blessed in the Messiah. Flick on to, uh, to Psalm 89. 
and uh, verse 26. The Messiah is crying unto God. He shall cry unto me. Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. See, Christ needed salvation. Verse 27. Also, I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. And it goes on. And so we see here, again, the connection between salvation, the firstborn, the seed, the covenant that is going to be made in Christ. The Amen. Have a look at verse um, 52. Blessed be Yahweh forevermore. Amen and Amen. There's the connection back again to the Amen in connection to the Messiah, the seed of salvation. The covenant is also mentioned there in verse 39. And it goes on. And we see all of these patterns interweaving again to lead us up to this idea of the certainty in the Amen, the faithful and true. I'll give you one more. Go over to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. We know this one well. Ho, it starts. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, Laodiceans. Come ye, buy and eat, yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labour for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me here. And your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Again, we have the covenant mentioned. And you know there it says, even the sure mercies of David. The word sure in the Hebrew is amen. The faithful and true mercies. The faithful and true of David. We'll get that covenant if we have ears to hear, brothers and sisters, if we listen to what the Spirit is saying, if we put into practice the things that we surely believe, we'll have that sure, amen, covenant of David extended towards us. This is what Brother Thomas says. When therefore the glorified Jesus says to the star angel presbytery of the ecclesia of the Laodiceans and through it to all that generation of ecclesias, and to us of these later times, in fellowship with them through the belief of the same things they received, when he says he is the Amen, it is equivalent to saying that all the promises not fulfilled in his first coming will assuredly be accomplished when he comes again, and that this advent with glory is as certain as the existence of the deity which none but a fool would call into question. Brother Thomas, he just wraps it up just beautifully when you've gone through all those passages, when we've connected the covenants, when we've connected the Amen, when we've connected the blessings that will come. He goes on to say, all the promises fulfilled in and through Jesus are the Amen. All who do not recognise this, do not accept him as the Amen, and therefore in effect charge the deity with unfaithfulness, for apart from Jesus anointed, they will never be performed. And so the question we have to ask ourselves this evening in our Bible class is, are we living our lives like those that deserve to be part of the Amen? Are we faithful? Are we true to our calling? Now, I've got one kind of final part to this class that I want to kind of open up. Because I think there's this practical element as well in how we might use this word Amen. Okay. And I'm hoping that thinking about this and maybe you might think about taking it on and using it yourself. And it will remind you of our time together this evening in the coming kind of days and weeks before our Lord returns and that you might find it of, of help to you. Think about this. How should we use Amen? 
the word, Amen. In public worship, of course, a brother would stand at the front and give his prayer, and he closes, Amen. In Jesus' name, Amen. And, uh, and I heard a few earlier, some brothers and sisters would say, Amen, out loud, confidently. Others might mumble it. Some, they might just say it in their heads. We don't really think about it much, do we, brothers and sisters? Why do we say that word at the end of our prayers? And what should we do with it? Should we actually say it out loud? Why, why, why? and does it really matter? Like, is this just some sort of church tradition we've adopted through the ways that we, that we conduct ourselves? Maybe we should have a think about that. <clears throat> so have a quick think about some principles. Now, there isn't one passage in the Bible. I'm not going to insist that everybody says amen or anything crazy like that. Don't worry. But I think it's worth looking at some, some passages. So let's go over to Deuteronomy chapter 27. Let's think about how God has revealed how this word should be used in his word. And, and he's recorded these things for our learning. As we know, all the things in scripture is God teaching us his ways, his way of thinking, as opposed to our way. His ways are far above our ways as the heavens above the earth. And here we have in Deuteronomy 27, Moses teaching the Levites what it, God expects of the people. And after uh, he teaches them, he says, it says in verse 14, and the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, cursed be the man that maketh any graven image, etc., etc., etc. And then towards the end it says, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. We believe and we agree with what has been said. <laughs> Publicly declare that. And this is the, the statue of Moses who is explaining what should happen at this particular day when the law is being explained. All the people shall answer, Amen. God expected that of those that were there, a public declaration of their agreement. Say it out loud with a loud voice. <coughs> Associate themselves with, with what had been said, what had been gone, of, gone before. They would believe it. They would agree with it. Let me show you a couple more. Come over to 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 36. Now, I know we're turning up a lot of passages here. But the thing is, if we want to understand a, a subject, we've got to look at what God has revealed from it. There's no point me just standing up here giving my opinion. Who cares about what Brother Matt thinks? Let's see how God has, has revealed himself, uh, the, his, his purpose with this word here in, in his word. 1 Kings chapter 1. And verse 36. And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king and said, Amen. And said, Amen. So Benaiah clearly was used to, he said it, he spoke it out loud. Let me show you another one. Go over to uh, Jeremiah 11. Did he think it? Did he mumble it? No, he did not. He said it out loud. He declared his confidence in what he was about to say. Same in Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, saying, and so on. And in verse 5, the, uh, it says at the end, Then answered I and said, So be it, O Yahweh. Amen, in the Hebrew, O Yahweh. He spoke it. He said it. He declared his confidence in what God had said. Go to Psalm 106. Psalm 106, verse 48. Blessed be Yahweh God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye Yahweh. Let all the people say it. Don't let them mumble it. Don't let them just think it in their minds. Let the people say it. Let the people declare. Let the people associate themselves with what, with what has just been said because they agree and because they believe it. Strong declaration endorsing what has gone before. So in hymns, you see, we all sing the words, don't we? We all associate ourselves with what has been said. 
And suggest in prayer, the way that we say amen is how we do that. We associate ourselves, we publicly declare that we agree and that we believe with what the brother has said. You know, it's interesting that the word amen in the Gospels is used um, as, a, uh, as a kind of a statement of, of confirmation five times, but it, it actually is used 47 times in total in, in the Gospels, and it's actually only ever used in how Jesus, when Jesus is talking. And did you know that it's only used, as I say, those five times at the end of something? The rest of the times, the 47 other times it's used, it's used at the start of something. And it's where Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, or verily, I say unto you. You see, Jesus was the amen. We say it at the end to say, yes, we agree and believe with what's gone before. Jesus said it at the start before he even opened his mouth. And he says it twice in, in the Gospel of John, Amen and Amen. He doubles up. That's the confidence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the Word made flesh, wasn't he? He was the Amen. It was proactive, not just reactive. But all we can do, brothers and sisters, is be reactive to what has been said before. To agree and to believe. Now this is, uh, this is a really interesting passage, I think. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Because we like to, um, to say to each other, do we not, that we model ourselves on the first century um, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do our best to get back to understanding things as they would have done and to conduct ourselves as best we can in the principles that they set out. And here in 1 Corinthians 14, the context is the first century. Okay, The context is the Holy Spirit gifts, which of course we do not have today. And we, we read of, of how the Apostle Paul, through inspiration, is exhorting the Ecclesia on how best to use those gifts. So, um, for example, um, if we look at uh, verse 6, it says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, this is the gift of tongues, the gift of speaking in different languages, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? So what he's saying here is, is if I come to you speaking in tongues, it's not going to profit you unless, of course, I'm speaking stuff that makes sense to you. It's like, it's like um, a different musical instrument. If it's not played in the right way, it's going to give different sounds. We've got to give a sound that makes sense. Verse 8, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Like if it's not clear that it's the trumpet, if someone blows the trumpet and a little doop comes out, no one's going to get ready for the battle. It's got to be clear that that's what is happening. He says then in verse 9, so likewise... Ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. So all this stuff we see in the evangelical churches around us when they speak words of, 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 that don't make any sense. Okay, that's not what is being taught here in scripture, is it? Make sense of these things. Verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Like we'll be foreigners to each other, like I won't understand what you're saying. He says, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the ecclesia, wherefore let him that speaketh in, the, in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So he's saying, we need some sense being brought to bear upon what you're saying. So don't just kind of hope to get one of these spirit gifts. There's no point in having it unless it is building people up, unless it is edifying the ecclesia. Now, why is that interesting? Well, because when we go into, um, into verse 15, we read this. What is it then? He says, I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. Else, 
When thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say Amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily, verily giveth thanks well, but the other is not edified. If somebody gets up to, to give thanks to God and speaks in, in Spanish, that's no point because we can't say amen to it because we don't understand. Well, I don't understand Spanish. Maybe some of you do, but there'd be no point. And that's the point that the Apostle Paul, through inspiration, is giving. But notice the detail there. He says, if that happened, how can somebody who occupieth the room of the unlearned say Amen at the giving of thanks. So there's a couple of things here, isn't there? The first is there is an expectation that when we pray, particularly publicly in the Ecclesia, brethren, there's an expectation that we are clear. It's one of the reasons I love it when brethren use a lot of scripture in their, in their prayers, because how can you not say amen to that? Because we understand what it means and we're reflecting the back, that back up to the Father. How? He says in verse 19, yet in the Ecclesia, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. It's all about being clear and making sense to people. So there's an expectation on our speaking brethren to be clear. But there's not just an expectation on the speaker, brothers and sisters, and on the prayer. There is an expectation on the audience. Did you notice it? How can, the, the, how can we say amen to something if we don't understand it? The expectation was that they were to say amen at the end of the giving of thanks. But they can't say amen if they don't understand it. We can't say amen to a prayer, brothers and sisters, if we don't agree or believe in what has just been said. If we don't agree to it, if it's false, if it's untrue, if it's not quite right. But if we do agree with the prayer, if it is right, if we do understand it, if we do believe it, then the implication by the apostles and by the ecclesia in the first century was that they would say amen at the end. So if the apostle Paul came to an ecclesia and um, the brother gets up to pray, says his prayer, ends with amen, sits down, no one says amen. What do you think that would mean? Well, it would either mean, according to this criteria, that nobody in the room actually understood what was said, or it would mean that they didn't agree with what had been said because they, they couldn't voice their connection to what had gone before. Perhaps, as a suggestion, you might want to think about that. But the point here, brothers and sisters, is when we pray, when we pray and we end with Amen, it's not just a little tag on the end, is it? It has that substance. It has that meaning. Just, um, just flick over to Matthew chapter 21. You know, we read in James, don't we, that, um, that the, the prayer of a faithful man is effective much. Let him ask in faith, it says in James five, uh, 1 verse 5. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. That should not be us, brothers and sisters. When we pray... We need to pray within the guardrails of the truth and what has been revealed to us as God's will. And so we can say amen in faith and confidence to what has been said. And this is the, uh, this is the, the kind of the thrust of what the Lord teaches us in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse uh, 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, amen, I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now it's interesting, brothers and sisters, that in verse one, we read where Jesus is at this time. When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives. So Jesus is there on the Mount of Olives and he says, we've got to pray with confidence. You mustn't doubt things. He says, if you pray with confidence, he says, this mountain will be removed. Now, I don't think he's just talking about any old mountain. They're on the Mount of Olives, right? I think he's referring back to Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. 
We pray for the Mount of Olives to split in two when the, the feet of the Lord touch the mountain. You remember the passage? And so we have to pray within the boundaries of what has been revealed to us. And we have to pray unwavering for those things. That's why we can say amen in confidence at the end. That's how Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. He teaches us to end our prayers with amen in confidence as to what we've prayed. We have to pray believing. That, and if we do, it will, um, it will, it will bring about the, the, the split of that mountain in two. And so, brothers and sisters, anyway, I think we'll, we'll probably leave it there for this evening. But hopefully we've, we've found great comfort in the meaning of this little word that the Lord chooses to reveal himself as to that ecclesia that's in our circumstances, the Laodicean state that we find ourselves in. It is a declaration, isn't it, of our agreement and our faith that we believe that what's going to come to pass will happen and that we agree with what has been said. And we thank God, don't we, for this meaning that he has attached to this tiny little word, the faithful and true witness, the Amen. And so I hope that you might think about this in, in your own walk, in your own lives, and find comfort in it. I certainly have. It will stimulate you in the coming days. And we pray that we'll all be there, won't we, brothers and sisters, to praise and to glorify God when the earth will be filled with that glory. And the kingdom will be here and Jerusalem will be a praise in the earth. And we'll know that when we are there, it's all because of the Lord and Master, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah of God. The seed through whom the covenant will come. The Amen, the faithful and the true witness to the promises of God. And when we are there, we'll know that through him, we have obtained that title. The mighty ones of the Amen. In the future, what a great hope, brothers and sisters, we have in these things.